So what I'm going to do is I'll just run through the main species for a rat nisher that you might see when you're out and about. And I might have squeezed a few in there that I just couldn't resist putting in because I think they just get me quite excited. And I've got a few sort of um, good video snippets if they work, hopefully you know what tech is like. Um, just to show you some of the records that people have sent in, which is sort of quite nice to see what's relevant and what people have seen practically um, over the winter time. So, um, so we'll start with sort of um, you know, our basics, uh, very important. These are our rabbits and our hares. Rabbits particularly important, even though a lot of people see them as being rather boring um, and not worth really sending records in because they're everywhere. But in fact, records of rabbits are pretty interesting because, of course, rabbits form the um, food source for a lot of our species, from our birds and uh, other mammals. So having an idea of how they're distributed uh, is interesting. So like locally, looking at rabbits, maybe just in the Ellen Valley, I can remember maybe when I first started there in about 2000, I would say there were more rabbits in the Yellow Valley, especially around the Clarewind Dams. There used to be people go up and they would ferret and things like that. But I would say over the last uh, 20 years, there are less records of them. Obviously, rabbits, they do have these boom and these bust populations. And of course, you know, if you've ever sadly seen one that's got pneumatosis um, you know, by the roadside with the little bulgy eyes, that's quite sad. But that does have an impact then on the rest of the food chain as well. So um, interesting because they're a food source for particularly some of the animals I really like, such as the stoats and uh, weasels and polecats and things like that. Although saying that, there seems to be a little burst of them back in the area. And talking to the men the other day, we were gathering in um, the sheep. Uh, we were all chatting about the wildlife things on our different farms and things. And uh, one thing you didn't see a lot of 20 years ago was hares in the Ellen Valley. Uh, you see the odd record, and that would be pretty exciting. But there are little places, locations now where hares are, you know, getting seen quite frequently. So there's a bit of a change in around. Hares used to be always sort of associated with sort of like the Carn Gaffalt area, just outside, uh, just uh, just within Raida. But they are spreading um, from a record point of view. But of course, there are concerns with the brown hares because. Um, they can also be found with mixomatosis, and we don't know how this is going to impact our brown hare population. So brown hares are not native originally to the UK. They have been brought in uh, by the Romans as a food source, but they are, I mean, they're a beautifully enigmatic species. I don't know any, especially women. We, we really do seem to associate with that sort of lunar hair and, and the sort of magical you know, uh, stories and our old customs that go through it. So, um, distinct from the rabbit, because they are generally a little bit bigger. Um, so you see by these photographs here, the one thing you look for when you see something bounding across the road with you is the ground tips, um, and that will tell you that it's a hare. And they also carry their tail lower, whereas when you see a bunny shooting into the head, which is usually how you see mammals, isn't it? They're usually pretty secretive and elusive you will just see that little white bunny top tail going off into the undergrowth. The ears are shorter, they're sort of a browner colour, uh, the hairs are a more richer orangey tone. Um, uh, and they sort of, they run different, they have a different sort of gait when they're running, they're sort of a little bit more, you know, um, elope around sort of if you see a hare running, uh, running away. And the other thing about a hare is that very often you'll be walking around somewhere and uh, you won't even know it's there, and the next minute it will lift off the ground and just go off um, because it will sit pretty tight until you're almost on top of them. And uh, a hare will have its young outside, so it will have uh, little leverets, they're called. They might have up to three of them, and they just make a little hollow in the ground, and then they put their little leveret gets put in there, and then they'll have another little leveret, maybe in the corner of the next field or one in someone's garden. I know of one that used to be in the in the cabbage patch, and they would see the mother coming in every day a few times as she would go to each of her little ones and feed them very rich milk. Rabbits and hares have got this really rich, um, uh, creamy, fatty milk, probably the most of all the mammals that we have. 
so they unroll quite quick. So the reason that the hair does this is because she, she's edging her back legs really, isn't she? So if something happens to one of the members, she still has the other couple to go. And whereas our bunny rabbits, if you think of Watership Down and their sort of social uh, side of things, um, they will have a burrow, and in that burrow, they will have their little kittens um, all together. Usually they'll pull out their little hairs on their body and they'll make a nice little nest, and they'll wear their youngsters in there as well. So a um, good time to see rabbits and hares sort of early in the morning and late in the evening, that sort of quiet time is a nice time to catch them. So this is a little rabbit, and I got this uh, in, uh, what did I go, Skullmore Island, where I had to look at the puffins, and I sit with my little girl having a picnic, and uh, this, this photo of this little rabbit having its own picnic, so um, uh, endearing little creatures as well. And then this is just a slightly, I haven't got any pictures of hares, it's just never seemed to get close enough. Uh, when I lived in Nesta, hares were so um, much more abundant, and they would come out of the edge of the out of the sort of edges of the hedges into the field, and then there'd be quite obvious boxing, and the numbers were great. Whereas here, our hares seem to be just a little bit more elusive, you know, they're on those woodland edges, uh, but just don't seem to see them quite the same way. If we've been lucky enough to watch hares boxing, that's pretty spectacular. And that tends to be the female, good old girl power there, <laughs> making sure that, the, that the, the fellas aren't bothering her until the exact time where she is actually ready to, to mate. Um, so she can't take all that fussing. Uh, but yeah, so that's them. And then, of course, this is our native hair, really. Probably would have been greater distributed, I suppose, with climate change and all. And that is still a concern with this. So this is our beautiful mountain hair. Uh, we don't have any of these in, uh, in the Yellow Valley. Uh, I don't know when the last record for mountain hair would have been recorded. Or it wouldn't have been recorded back then. Nobody did that. But whether you look through old historic accounts, you can see things where they hunted and shot and gathered pelts and things. But it would have been a long time anyway. Um, but they're in Scotland, just hanging on, um, and uh, I think they're in parts of North Wales as well. And uh, they're quite distinct because, of course, they go this beautiful white colour in the winter, and that's their camouflage because they're on the slopes, up in the Cairngorms and places like that. And then uh, I probably should have put a picture of them um, when they go then into their sort of summer coat, so that all the hair sort of starts to fall out. The hair's on the hair, it starts to fall out and it turns more like a little, almost the colour of the, the mountain next to it, and uh, that'll be their summer coat. Of course, the problem is, if, if things start warming up on our, in our planet, and we're not getting as much snow in the highlands, that means that actually, instead of them being more camouflaged, they're actually more open to predation. Um, so I know there are worries about that. But they're an amazing animal, and when we did go to the Cairngorm, you know, we were able to get some here to about you from them, you know, they will tolerate a little bit of uh, people um, coming, you know, and having a look. And you, they've got personalities as well. When you spend a bit of time with them, you realise they've just got different natures. Some are flighty, some are easygoing. Um, and again, this was a time of year where they were sort of starting to mate, so it's coming into sort of February, March, so uh, they were starting to pair up. And then um, talking a bit about the foxes, and one sitting there, so they're looking at me, sitting there saying, hey, you're talking about me now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, we've got um, obviously our foxes, our wild cats, our <coughs> skeletons. The foxes are particularly fairly common in this area. Um, not always so easy to see. They are, um, you know, I suppose there is a difference to the rural fox and the urban fox, having lived in both places. In Leicester, where I would have seen foxes quite frequently, usually at the end of your drive, look, looking around your bins. Um, and, you know, I live in the hills in the Allen Valley, and we'd be lucky to see a fox, but they're definitely there because their signs are everywhere. Um, and that's often a clue with mammals. It's not actually, sometimes the sightings are rare and they're special when you get them, but it's actually the signs that you're looking for to see what's there. So for this, there's a picture, this is when we had snow one year, and there's the distinct fox track going up the road, uh, where dogs would you know, have little prints like that, the fox tends to walk, you know, a bit of a line like that, and the little 
Prince that he is behind us there because we then want a little bit like like a Tudor rose that sort of pattern in uh, into the snow. Uh, this is a fox cat, obviously with a badger, and then um, you can even get these black sort of melanistic foxes, especially in places like um, Bristol where they have populations of these sort of uh, foxes with that colour. Um, yeah, and one of the facts is, is, did you know that there was at least 28 different calls? Um, of course, we all know mostly about that call that's the vixen sort of come around September time uh, when she, she sort of screams and it sort of on a nice moonlit night you often hear them out there uh, and then you can hear sometimes the dogs, fox um, answering um, till they find each other. And then the badger, well, he's probably one of the easiest to identify um, with his little black uh, and white face pattern. So he will have, or she will have, um, maybe up to about three or four cubs. They sort of mate um, sort of in the autumn. And then Marcellus, and particularly sort of the, uh, badgers, they have what's called uh, delayed um, implantation so they can hold the embryo and sort of knowing what condition their body is in, what food is available, they can almost, their body can sort of choose um, how many youngsters to bring on for the next spring and uh, it's all to do with food and the condition of the, the body um, because obviously there needs to be abundance of food to feed the young and have the milk and everything. So it's quite a, um, a useful technique um, of um, some species, and that tends to be mustelids and bats, will do the same thing as well. The bats are a bit different, they'll actually hold on to the sperm until they're ready for it to fertilize, and then, then they will have their pup then. So again, when you know when you've got a badger about, you tend to find quite obvious tracks and signs, their footprints, they're quite, because they're quite heavy animals, and um, because they're um, part of the mustelid family, so like the um, whole cat you've got on the table there and the weasels and the stoats. And mustelid means mouse-like spear. So when you look at it like that, you can see that little sort of more mouse-like head with that particularly long body that gives them their name. And the badger is, is like that too. Not as long as some of them, but he is. And um, these animals can, um, you know, they've been around uh, the UK for a long time and uh, some of the old uh, badger sets, they can be like hundreds of years old. And the nice thing about it, was a, a set with badgers in it is they're known as clans, which I think is quite a nice thing. I think we would have been clans ourselves once, so it just is a nice thing to, to still use. Um, it's a very clean animal, uh, particularly this time of year when there's young uh, being had in February. They start to come out the sets around about April, so there is give and take on it. Uh, but they'll be cleaning out those sets. They'll be um, sometimes they're renowned to if, the, if a badger dies in the set, um, they can't like call him out. So what they often do is they will bung up that little bit of the set and they'll leave it in there. And uh, time they'll forget about it. And then once they're cleaning out one other year and creating a new chamber, they might come across some of the bits that are left, just some of the bones. And sometimes when you find bones on the top of a badger set. Very often, that's probably where it's come from. You know, it's uh, old badgers that have been brought back out <coughs> in, uh, in years to come. So, yeah, uh, an endearing little animal, really. Um, and a particularly a woodland animal, but as we developed as humans and we've got farmland, they've particularly taken to those sort of field margins and stuff. So, the numbers have increased dramatically. Um, and a lot of that is due to probably we've made the perfect uh, landscape for them as well. Uh, so this is a little badger that was peeking over the edge in Scotland, which is really lovely to see because these badgers would come out of their set just a little bit earlier, sort of at twilight. You would get to sort of see them and, and photograph and things in the dark is quite difficult. So it was quite nice just to get a quick snap uh, of them. But it was lovely to watch them. They've got such social behaviours, they scratch at each other, they bite each other's bums, they mark everything, they pee and they poo, and yeah, they're quite busy, uh, interactive little animals. Uh, and if ever you get a chance to go back to watching, I'd definitely say take it, you know. 
And this is not something we have, but I came across this picture when I was setting this talk up and uh, I just could not put it on. So this is a wolverine, and this is a particularly rare mammal. I think there's only about 200 of them. Um, and these ones are in Finland. We meant to have a look at some brown bears because I have this sort of fascination with knowing that our landscape wanted things like you know, bears and wolves and beavers and all the sorts of things uh, before man cleared and did his thing. Um, so I didn't expect to see a wolverine and then uh, this wolverine ran out and we were in like a little hide and the man next to me, the camera was going <laughs> like that was like a machine gun and that is the wolverine going what the hell was that? <laughs> Just giving me enough time to get a picture, but I think the whole trip is one picture of a bear which was very poorly taken, but it just was so close, it was so amazing, and this wolverine. So again, it's a mustelid, it's very related, uh, related to the badger, but badgers avoid these. These are pretty ferocious. I mean, you think of, uh, you know, the wolverine, the the marvel or whatever superhero he is, and correct me if I got them wrong, my son's always saying, no, Marvel, it's not Marvel. Um, anyway, you know, that's what it's named for, it's, it's, it's pretty deadly. So we'll move on to um, another one of our mustelids, or two of our mustelids, and that is the otter and the mink. So I've got a, a mink pelt over there, and um, yeah, both of these you can see in sort of uh, Radnorshire. Um, more so the otter, which is probably good news really. So obviously the otter is one of our native animals, quite a biggish animal really, uh, with a tapering tail, still has that long um, mouse-like spear thing to it. Um, it lives most of its life in the watercourse or along the watercourses, rivers and canals and, uh, and the sea as well, estuaries. Um, is this the next? That's the mink, yes. Okay, a little bit more support. Let's turn this around. So the mink that will be handed around is much smaller than the otter. The otter will be, you know, a lot bigger than that, a lot bigger animal, really. And um, the mink itself um, was introduced, so for fur, so uh, they were reared in places and then they were killed and then their pelts will, would go to making coats and stuff you know i think my mother has a, had a really old coat from back in the 70s when that was how it was and then of course uh, that got a lot of people mad what why an animal was kept just to be taking its fur so they were um, activists and they released the mink um i suppose with the good intentions behind it but it actually did a lot more damage because um, they had a rather negative impact on our native wildlife. Um, but as an animal, the mink is, uh, he is a bit of a character, you know, the only problem is, is that we took him over here and introduced him. Other than that, uh, you know, I've seen a few mink in my time and they tend to be quite bold. The ones I used to see again when I spent my year in Leicester, they used to come up to you and used to come up to the fishermen quite regularly and they just stand on their back legs and they would tell them where to go. <laughs> and they've just got this, I suppose, I've had ferrets, and so I, I'm quite um, familiar with the sort of traits of, of the muscellid family. And there's something a bit mink in the mink that reminds me a bit of that. They're wild, but they still have this sort of rather bulky nature and will stand up to men in a way that most of our other muscellids would be phew, gone straight away. Um, the mink you've got there um, is a Radnorshire mink, I'm sorry to say. Um, he was trapped and dispatched, with a better word of saying it, because he was found uh, where there are water bowls. And the mink have had a massive impact on water bowls, which have nearly, you know, we've nearly lost our water bowls in the UK. So it was a bit of that tough love uh, type of thing. And they're that colour, they're that chocolate all over colour with that long sort of tapering tail. And they will spend their time in the water like the otter will, but they will more likely also spend their time around sort of farms and villages and into gardens and things like that. They're a little bit, they'll take different prey items, whereas the otter tends to be mostly aquatic sort of prey items. Um, now if you find some droppings, and there are some there, I need to get a new, my sort of smelly, smelly droppings. But uh, if you were to find a 
a scat as we call it, which is a poo on a rock or something like that, and you would smell it, because everybody does that, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> um, if it smelled quite not unpleasant, so it might smell a bit fishy, or a bit like tea, they say, like jasmine tea, um, not offensive, that's going to be your upper springs, and very often it will have little bits of creatures in it, little bits of frog remains, of fish scales, of crayfish, and things like that. Um, if you were to find a mink scat, it tends to be a little bit more um, like, a little, like a little sausage, a little squiggly sausage. Uh, but if you were to smell that, your eyes would probably roll up because it's just not nice. So um, that would be the difference. Um, so yeah, obviously otters themselves, they live as well in hosts. And they have, again, a couple of um, youngsters usually a year uh, or every couple of years. Uh, most of our mammal records for otters, I'm afraid, do come in as roadkill because they're sort of on the edges of roads, maybe looking for amphibians and things like that, or cross, having to cross roads um, to get to different waterways, and very often they will get uh, hit. The mink records tend to be more sightings. Um, so there's some otter traps, and again, you can see the little paw prints. Uh, their paws as well are different than the minks. If you had a chance to look at the minks when you went round, um, they were like proper little foot, little toes and everything, whereas the otter has this sort of webbed foot, um, which is uh, important for obviously swimming in the water. And his coat is, um, is better suited than the minks for the water because it's got this sort of outer guard uh, coat on the top, the hairs, and they sort of give like a um, insulated, well, no, they give like a protective to the water, can't really seep into it. And then underneath is like a sort of denser, thicker fur, and that sort of gives the insulation to the otter so they can spend a lot of time in the water compared to the mink. And that's again why they spend a lot of time grooming and looking after that coat, because it's very important um, to see them through uh, catching their fish. And there is a picture of um, otter sprays that you would typically see. Um, the attractive squirt on the side of the, <laughs> on a ledge for you. And then we'll move on to the stoats and the weasel. And there are a couple of pelts there, just to get a little feeling for sort of the scale and the size. They've been stretched a little bit probably than they would be in the wild, because they haven't to do their body anymore. But, um, so you have a stoat here, this is a stoat, this picture was taken <coughs> more about 15 years ago by a visitor to the Ellen Valley, who sent it in. That was up behind uh, the toilet at Clarewind, and uh, what this little devil was up to was it was going in and out of this little rocky wall, and it had got itself some little uh, pies of wagtails, youngsters that were nesting in there. So uh, they're quite a ferocious hunter, um, quite, quite admirable. Um, really, and we've had quite a lot of good sightings of stoats and even weasels recently, where there's sort of thing that as they go past you, you think, what was that? You, did you see it? No. What did it look like? I don't know. Was it, was it that side? So there are tricky little creatures um, if you see them briefly, but when I tend to see something like that run across the road, there are some telltale things to sort of think when it's going past, what was that? So. A stoat itself has a black tip to the tail uh, in winter and in summer. And that is quite distinct because as it will run, it will tend to hold this little tail up a bit. It's sort of one of the things, uh, one of their habits. And especially if somebody gets in their way, it sort of goes up and across. So it's a bit like a little flag. And the other thing about a stoat is when it is sort of running, it has this little bit of a bounding gait. Um, and then it's a little more slight orangey color and uh, it's got this, like the weasel, it's got like a brownish back and a white tummy. And you'll see that from the, from the little things going round. Um, and the way I remember, because sometimes you do get, it's easy to get to forget, but this is one of the distinctions is the stoats brown, or orangey brown, uh, and this sort of white color is a straight line between the belly and the back. So stoat S for straight line. And then the weasel, which is a more chestnut brown with an even more vivid white looking um, underbelly. He's weasel, so he's wonky. So he has this sort of more wonky 
five <laughs> But of course, when they're going past, you've got as much time as you are they want you, or are they not? But they'll be obviously will be missing that tail flag on the weasel. And then when the weasel runs across you, he really is noticeably smaller. I mean, we're sort of talking this size. The problem is there is like sexual dimorphism. So with the mustelid, usually the male of the species is bigger than the female of the species. Usually about twice, not nearly twice, so a third as big as they are. Um, so, but the weasel itself, it won't bound across the road. It's the little thing that just runs really quick and you mm -hmm. think, was that a mouse or was that a weasel? And then, you know, so it's, it's that sort of shooting thing. So those are sort of little things I try and use when it all is happening really quick. And there's a little picture here, this little baby weasel being fed some milk. I had a friend and he had um, his ferrets, had had, uh, the, the Jill had had a litter and he managed to find a little weasel that had been left behind. Um, mothers will move, especially the stoats and weasels, they'll have their litter and they'll quite frequently move them about the countryside. They'll change their little den places and uh, there's a number of times I've seen that happening. That's amazing to watch, you know, the mum with a couple of things going across like this. But inevitably she will maybe drop one and either keeps going or something disturbs and she doesn't go back. So there was this one weasel and he picked it up and he reared it with the litter of ferrets. And uh, he used to take it around school then. It, it lived for about 18 months. But the one thing about it, whereas the ferrets would allow you to be handled and they were all brought up together, it was always wild. It always retained that wildness about it. So, uh, it, you know, even though it was well handled and stuff, it was still giving, giving them a bit of a tearing off like so. So, right, yes, uh, I think that's that. So this is a trail camera I put up in the Ella Valley in the Glamai Forestry. And I put a, an egg up with some peanut butter and just thought, I'll see what comes to it. I don't know if I can get this to work now. Um, yeah, there we go. Ooh. That's it, tail. This one's white, so it's a stoat in ermine. Uh, that's something you don't see quite so often, right? With climate change and stuff, that is another concern. But in the Ellen Valley, and I have records for St. Harmon and Patty Door, uh, slightly higher elevations, I do get stoats in ermine. I don't think I've had a stoat in ermine from anywhere else in Ramish yet. It's not to say they don't happen, but unless I have records and I can't build up that, that mental picture, which is why mammal records are so important. Um, but yeah, wasn't it great? I mean, if you think back to some of those old sort of history lessons and you would see King Henry Tudor or, or whatever sitting there with his white sort of fluffy, you know, um, on his cloak, wasn't it? And it would have little black bits. That is the ermine of the stoat. And uh, particularly, I think it was Queen Elizabeth I. There is a picture of her somewhere and she's sitting with a, a stoat next to her on the chair. And again, stoat was to purify sort of innocence. It was supposed to be yeah, about purity, I suppose. And this changing of one, you know, to the other, I suppose, because she was a maid and she hadn't quite been married or something, you know, so she was, you know, whatever. So that was sort of the intention of it in the image. Um, whereas weasels, bless them, nobody wants a weasel, do they? If you've ever seen Wind in the Willows, read the books or whatever, and saw the weasel clans, you know, they're always up to something sneaky. And in Welsh, the word for weasel is wenky, which if you read the whole list of maybe about 25 words that that means, and that's a beautiful thing about Welsh, um, it's all things like scoundrel and ruffian and, and uh, not very well liked at all. So um, yes, let's go throw away with that. So this is one of the uh, ones from St. Harmon, and this was again one in Irvine, this is a couple of years ago. Um, I love this one because he's got like, these little sunglasses on, didn't quite turn all white. And again, you'll get them like that, you'll get them like mottled colours as well. Um, but this one needs a bit of chipping. I just think maybe the ones up the valley and stuff have been, um, you know, they're genetically, because uh, they say that they're supposed to change 
that coat colour is instigated by the cold. But of course, there must be some genetic thing under underlying as well, because it wasn't particularly a very cold winter. And there was another white wreck, but of a different stoat, because it was only at the same time, on right up the other end of the valley. And it was in Irvine as well. So, uh, Thank you. 
farmers believe that they choose the years of sheep at night while they're sleeping in the fields. <laughs> so there are probably a lot of bad stuff going with them, but I think they're one of the most amazing animals. And again, their social abilities are fantastic. You know, they will chatter away. And, uh, I'll show you the video as well in a minute. And then we come to the pine martin, which was once sort of uh, back in hundreds of years in history. One of our, it was our second most common mammal that we had, and now it's our second rarest mammal, only being sort of beaten by the Scottish wildcats. And again, we just hunted them to extinction. And I have some old records from the Ellen Valley days for the Lewis Lloyd estate, where back, in, I think it was about 1890 something, it was written down, they used to keep counts of how many goats and martins and things they caught. So I was interested first to think, oh my God, there are records of Martin in the valley then actually seen. And then um, even then sort of the, you know, the lord of the estate had sort of noted that the numbers were dwindling and he put a stop on the hunting of the Martin, which is quite encouraging to think that, you know, it wasn't just eradicate. He did have something a little bit different than the balance of it all. But in many places, again, you know, they, they they are pretty keen predators, and um, you know predators do get a bad rep as well. I mean, they, in a perfect world, in a perfect forest system, they're they're perfect for everything. But of course, people when that same decline, they suppose they did put another pressure on in some places. But man was really the pressure, not uh, the pine martin himself. So they will use uh, red you know, places to poo, and their poo is quite distinct. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. That's very can't wait. <laughs> and um, they're called a sweet mark, so they smell quite sweet. They really smell altogether quite pleasant, uh, they say. <laughs> so people look at me thinking, there's no way a poo could be pleasant. I don't care what she tells me, but it, it is, it doesn't trust me. Uh, how smells it and isn't bad at all. So um, again, it's also a bit of an omnivore uh, from the mustelid world, where we've talked about one of the most well, co cattle birds and amphibians and things. The pine martin will take all those things uh, and eggs and everything, but will also take things like blackberries and uh, other things that find worms and beetles and things. So, uh, so the pine martin, again, like the polecat, is more a nocturnal animal. So that's why we wouldn't come across them. And we've always had a few like possible records from the area dating back to the sort of 1960s. Um, and so it's considered that there was sort of a population of pine martin, but maybe a bit like the red kite story, at such low density that there wasn't particularly much population increase. You know, genetically, they were probably related. And a few years back, I don't know how many years get further back, but uh, maybe five now, six years ago, they released 20 pine martins, or well, 18, I think, into the Haveron Forest near Tanidloid and then uh, into the Havard Forest, up towards sort of Grimistwick Way. And that was, um, we had to do a lot of research before that they did that, but that was just to sort of improve the gene pool. And probably the mid Wales pine martins are probably genetically the most robust now because when they collected martins, so they took martins from Scotland that were either maybe um, in areas where they were doing really well, where it wouldn't have an impact on that population, and they were collecting them from different places, so they were all taken out of the same place, and then they were taken down for genetic, pretty diverse, and uh, they were released. And we have records now coming in from Pine Martin, so I think that's really quite exciting because I think you know you go to Scotland, you go on holiday, I mean it's one of your top five animals to see. If you could see a Pine Martin, your trip to Scotland has been well worth it. Um, so again, we'll be having that in Wales. So this is a cold cat that got itself into a squirrel trap, uh, not far from here, from Gumpsnow, maybe just about a month ago, not even that, maybe. He's a bit slow down, but he's telling them right off. <laughs> he's like, get me out of here, because I'm not supposed to be in this. And that's really one of the lovely noises that they make, is they follow them. So this is the, the cold cat. Again. And then this one was taken, I can't give the location, but it's not far from Raider, as you say, within a eight mile radius. And uh, it was on my birthday last uh, 
December. And uh, this is Pine Martin. There he goes. And it just picked him up as he comes through. And you can just, I'll say it one more time, you can see this sort of lovely uh, creamy coloured bib that makes them um, quite distinct. And the other thing about the Pine Martin is, again, it's a good sized animal, it's quite cat like in its appearance and the way its mannerisms are. Um, once you see it, you you know you can't mistake it. So let's see if we do that again. There he goes. Like this. And gone. So yeah, that's a Pine Martin record for, for the locality for there. And I know that when Vincent Wildlife Trust that did the releasing program were involved, they you know they did record kits and all as well, because they were all radio type. Uh, this is some of the ones that were left out. And then this is a trip to Scotland last year. Um, which I always wanted to see Pine Martins. There's a lot of te people telling me they've seen Pine Martins, and I spend an awful lot of time in the hope. I drive up and down the valley at night all hours, and I've never seen one. And yet, Neil from the bike shop said, Oh, see the Pine Martins will pass you for the day. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but anyway, this year I got to see them. Um, I've got some little things. So, there they are. There were three kits in the kit. And uh, just showing their playfulness. They're playing around with Scott's pine tree, mum's on the ground rubbing an egg or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, they're making lots of traffic up the noise. And my friend goes, God, the cameras are buffering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, that was a great experience. Yeah. Great animal. And there's one of the pictures that I got up, uh, one of the kids, quite well grown now, um, sitting uh, on the edge of the log, just moving around. So it's so pretty. And this is your Pine Martin Poo. So a lot of our Mustelle Poo, uh, there might be some examples there for you. I need to update my examples. They're a bit, uh, a bit crispy now. But, um, <laughs> most of the Mustelle Poo's are sort of like this sort of shape, spotted shape. But then they have these little tapers and these little sort of wiggles as it comes out. It sort of looks a bit messy. But a Pine Martin has a distinct sort of horseshoe-shaped poo. So throughout the walk, you know, you see that on the road banks and in the woodlands and stuff like that. Just have a sniff. <laughs> it smells quite nice. You've already eliminated most of it, except for the otter. So uh, it is quite distinct. And then we we'll probably just touch a little bit <coughs> on foxes. Obviously, we get records for stock foxes in Radnorshire, um, quite a, a common mammal. Um, this is a picture taken again on another gathering day a few years ago. The men came in and they were like, oh, there's a family of foxes just up there. So um, after they had all their food and got rid of them, I uh, went out to have a look and it was evening light and just managed just to sit there just to enjoy the and She had four cubs with her and uh, I suppose they were on the side. She didn't seem at all bothered. She knew I was on the other side of the hill, but she wasn't bothered. She was just playing with the youngsters. So again, part of the, the dog family and great animals. Um, we did have a few records maybe the last few months, on a silver fox. And I did put a number of trail cameras out to try and get it. Did find a fox that was quite grey coloured. Um, and you can't get silver foxes, uh, sort of colouring. Um, one that was maybe down to his, his back. But, uh, and then another record came in from, from Drindod Wells as well. So it would be nice just to have that, something different, you know, just to see. Because, uh, again, we have the old record of coloured rabbits and just to something to tell people and you know, keeping your eye out for things. And so yeah, uh, great animal. And then we have, a few years ago, this is a barn owl box going up in one of the valley barns for the barn owl. Um, and the barn owl is a very useful um, uh, animal because it's a, a predator of small animals. And the barn owls particularly do well in the place. That means there's usually abundance of small mammals and things for it to, to feed on. And then, additional to that, and I don't know if I've got some over there, when the barn owl catches its prey, it will eat it, and then it will regurgitate very pleasantly all the bones and the bits of fur, sort of sticks them out, and then uses all the bits that it really wants uh, and takes them down. So the little pellet that's then spat out. Usually they leave in piles, um, often near a roost or a feeding roost site. 
and uh, you can collect those pellets up. Um, I tend to have people that did, um, they do sort of monitor the barn owls, so obviously going into a known barn owl route isn't something that you should do, but they would collect, if they were going in to maybe check the birds or ring them, they might collect the pellets, or I could go back again when they weren't breeding, collect the pellets, and then you'd be able to tell what the diet of the, the barn owl was. And they found some interesting things in the pellets, so, um, Water shroom was turning up. We had a few bat remains in some of the pellets, which is quite nice. In other parts of the UK, they have had their first records of, say, door mice or detecting harvest mice. Um, so it's always worth checking your sick. Um, and um, that's quite a nice little project. Kids like doing it. You sort of appreciate the whole cycle of um, prey and predator and, and a little bit about mammals. So the main thing that they will be catching, uh, these are the, bowl, uh, the shrew family. So we've got the water shrew that I mentioned, and we have um, the common shrew and the pygmy shrew. And this is quite a good picture. I think I've got another one there, but just for the shrews. So they're the ones that uh, are like a, a bit mice-like, I suppose people refer to them as. They don't quite have the long mousy tail. They don't have the big mouse, Mickey Mouse ears that mice have, ears that Mickey Mouse does. They've got like little pointier noses, generally quite smaller. And um, so these are the shrews. And uh, this water shrew, you can see, is quite distinct. Picture of him up there as well. And he's got a really white underbelly and a really black um, back. He's also got a dome tail. They've all got quite a dome tail. And the water shrew, as you imagine, is found near the water. And often you will see just a little silvery thing and little bubbles coming off the back of it. And it will spend most of its time there collecting things like snails and uh, little animals that live in the water, and that's what it will feed on. And then the common and the pygmy shrew, um, you can get quite frequently in gardens and in fields and stuff. And the only difference between them is the pygmy shrew is obviously smaller, but that's only easy if you see a pygmy shrew and a common shrew, otherwise they're just little things. But the pygmy shrew tail is more than half his body, so if you were to take that tail like that, that's your pygmy shrew, whereas your common shrew is about half the shrew's body. Um, so that's the way you sort of look out for it. The common shrew, uh, the common shrew also has like three toes on its coat. So that's only useful again if you find it dead, you know, on the side of the track or the cat has discarded or something. Whereas the pygmy shrew is more like just a little bit grey and you can't really see the, the change in the colour from the back to the belly. And this is just a simple key. So I just wanted to make sure I reminded myself that I've covered most of the shrews and got your mole there, we'll move on to that in a second. And there we go, with a bit of colour to make it a little bit better. So just want those three points as I said to you about the, the colour of their coat and the length of their tail. The other thing about the sort of water shrew is along its tail, apart from the fact it is obviously very different, and I have found one um, in the park in Raider down at the Grove. Um, maybe a cat or something, or maybe had something else that got hold of it, and, and shrews don't taste very nice generally. Um, and they let it go, but you can see the little teeth marks in it. They've got this little line of stiff hairs under the tail, and that's again something that helps them when they're in the water to swim around. Um, and they have got slightly webbed feet compared to the other two shrews. So, um, shrews, when you do get their remains in owl pellets, their teeth have got like little red tips on the end of them and they've got like an iron residue in it. Um, so that makes them distinct in owl pellets from mice, which have like little yellow front teeth, and their teeth look more like human's teeth, like molars, look like molars like this. Um, and the other thing about shrews is that uh, their saliva, so when they kill something, uh, very often they'll bite it, and their saliva is quite nasty and toxic, and that often kills uh, the animal. It has sort of an impact on its neurological side. And uh, so known was this fact that the Egyptians used to collect this side of saliva and put it on the tips of their arrows and things for when they were hunting. Um, so, yeah, the only venomous mammal in Britain. In the past. Um, and if a human is bitten, the pain will be similar to a bee sting. And the wound will go septic. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's a little shrew. But they're quite, quite cute flies. I find most. Those enjoy boxes. So yeah, there was a better picture of the, the little red tipped teeth. 
That's not actually the actual side of it, but I'll stop there. <laughs> True, that's <laughs> And then, again, there's not so much to say about the mould. You'll be quite familiar with the mould. And so, the little mouldy is there, and there's a skin at the back as well. So they've got these, and I think one of my favourite features of theirs is that they've got these big shovel-sized hands. So obviously that's what they're for, for digging. Um, they have a teeth. They're an insectivore as well. So they have these teeth that have toxins on them, um, but they sort of only sort of get hold of earthworms, they seem to be able to stun that. Obvious by the fact that they leave their mold hills and they spend most of their time in that uh, little underground world where there's tunnels and hunting up and down in the tunnels and mostly only coming up the males when they are going seeking for a female and um, they have usually dark coats although I have records of, um, of gingery ones and uh, sort of both ginger and white ones as well, so you can get a gain of colourings. Um, and their coat is there's a little uh, pelt there, but if you were to put your hands over it like that, you'll notice that it runs, that the hairs will run equally. There's no resistance, you know, like it's all, it'll fold over. So when they go into the tunnels, they can go as easily that way as they can go back as well. And uh, they do have eyes, but there is that saying, <coughs> blind as a mole. Um, but they're only little tiny eyes uh, because they, they seek everything out by using their whiskers and they can hear the little footsteps and everything of the little creatures that are in their tunnels. And their hearing is pretty good as well. And then I've just put these in, so it's a hedgehog. And the hedgehogs are now on our red list, uh, which is very sad actually, I think, of uh, things that maybe everybody gets to interact with it on a mammal scale is the hedgehog. Um, sometimes I have records in the radar of hedgehogs making a heck of a noise in uh, one garden up by the school where they have quite a lot of hedgehogs in and they can be quite noisy. I mean, hog, being like hog, they squeal. And especially when they're mating and they're whatever, it, it, it's a lot of noise. Um, but it's lovely then to see the little babies coming through the garden, she says, with uh, looking for a little bit of food. Never feed hedgehogs milk, as you definitely probably knows that now. It's just water or something like cat food or something um, because they can't digest uh, cow's milk. Um, why have they come under problems? I suppose possibly climate change is gain another factor for them because they hibernate in the winter and this is their strategy when there isn't much of the invertebrate food, so the insectivores again, so they need the beetles and the bugs, and there's not as much of that in the winter, so they fatten themselves up, and then they hibernate, and they need those sort of cold spells to sort of just keep them in that hibernation state. The more they wake up and have to come out and get hungry, they use their reserves. Um, I have a lot of records from when the Howie Hedgehog Ross Hospital was going, so they would collect hedgehogs, and I had a really much better idea of their distribution in the county, which is sort of nice to see. It makes it look like there's more, but obviously that was just giving us a picture of where they were. They seem to think a lot of their hedgehogs they were getting, um, they were also suffering from um, uh, worms and stuff, like lung worms and things, um, whether or not they're getting that's a climate thing and it's more favourable, um, I'm not sure. Um, and the other thing is, uh, I suppose roads have a big impact on hedgehogs, and uh, badgers have had a big impact on hedgehogs. Um, how much that is playing into the whole ecology is still being looked at, but obviously as they, they're both using the same habitats and um, the badger is able to get his hands on a hedgehog and, and uh, be able to pull it apart, you know, can get the claws in a little bit better. So I think it's probably all this stuff that has had an impact on this uh, sweet, little, sweet little mammal really. And then we get on to the rodents then. So um, we've got a uh, mice. So Mickey Mouse, think of that. So you know when it's a deer that's sticking out, you've got a mouse. Um, so we've got actually two different mice here, but they do look quite similar. So the one on the left is a little wood mouse in the shed. And the reason that is different is because it has like a little, pre a little yellowy chest spot on its white underside. It's got its big ears and an unusual thing. The one on the right is a yellow neck mouse, and they're pretty similar. 
um, until you sort of have a lot of mice about you, you might get a jizz that they're different then. So the yellow mutton mouse is probably the one I get the most records for in the house, mostly, uh, in loft spaces, um, because they, they're quite arboreal, so they're usually up in trees and things, so they like being in lofts. And uh, the difference with them is they have, instead of having the little yellow chest strap, yellow neck, so they've got this like yellow that goes right, I don't know if they should have one there, but goes right across the front. And uh, they're also generally a bigger mouse, so that only makes sense if you have adults, you know, adults and juveniles are all over the place. But they're generally a bigger mouse, and if you catch, so if I do mammal tracking and I humanely catch him, the different mammals, maybe showing them or doing some surveys on them. You catch a little wood mouse and you sit and look at you, like do a bit of this or whatever. Or if you get a yellow neck mouse and you let him out of the trap, without a guarantee he is bouncing, <laughs> he is really sort of feisty, he's got a completely different nature, uh, he's very white underneath. So there are two different mice. So if your cat does bring in, if you've got cats that bring in rodents, have a look, you know, because they're again probably pretty under recorded because they're just sort of lumped in with field mice, but uh, uh, I was field all with mice. And then another little record that we have for Radisha is the door mice, and they are, uh, they're like sweetness overload. <laughs> and I'd say the biggest, again, threat to them is probably the climate side of things, because again, they're one of these mammals that has to hibernate, and uh, they go into true sort of torpor, and they've got this, this beautiful tail, and that tail, what can look at absolutely beautiful, is um, is a place where it stores its body fat. So that's where most of the fat that it gets goes to. So when they're born, say about uh, May, June time, they can have a few litters. And the big thing is in that autumn harvest, that uh, glut that there is of blackberries and apples and, and uh, insects or whatever's around, they have to just eat it their way everywhere. So they need to put those stores on. The interesting thing about a dormouse as well, it's got these little sticky pads almost on its feet. And if you ever have your dormouse and it's grabbed onto you, it's like almost like suction pads. And they also are able to rotate their feet quite like that. So they are sort of designed for the hazel dormouse for the sort of woodland situation. And that makes walking along the, uh, the branches easy and clinging onto them. They don't tend to use their tail to be able to hold on, um, like some of the species, but they will use that tail to give them balance. They've got that lovely reddy colour fur, big current eyes, ears, not quite as big as the, the other typical field mouse and harvest mouse, and, and um, the yellow neck mouse. And uh, yeah, adorable. When they go into hibernation, they're completely knocked out. I have had a few incidents where like uh, mice will get in and they'll actually eat uh, little door mice, you know. It's you know, like, really, that's pretty grim, isn't it? <laughs> but that happens to nature, isn't it? That's the way it all happens. Um, and uh, yeah, it takes a few weeks, four weeks or whatever, and they're four to five weeks, and the mother's out there taking her young behind them. Hazel woodlands are particularly important. Um, because they have that understory, a little bit more light in those woodlands tend to have a little bit more sort of uh, blackberries and, and other sorts of, and of course the hazelnut from the tree. And another threat to the dormouse has been uh, the release of the grey squirrel because they're able to take the hazelnut off the tree before the dormouse can get at it. So they can eat it when it's sort of a bit green, whereas the dormouse has to wait to where it's sort of totally whitened. And when they start to eat it, so your squirrel will just like and just break the, the shell I have. Whereas a dormouse is a sweet little thing and he will scoop his little teeth around this nut and there will be this perfectly little hole and then he will get the nut out. So that's one of the telltale signs to know is the dormice in a particular hazel woodland if you look at what has been eating the nut. So um, lovely. And this one, I had to upload these pictures, so uh, because oh, I'd love to go and see proper harvest mice. We have two locations for harvest mice right down the other end of uh, Radnisha, right on the tail end of it. Haven't been able to find any other records to date, but they're, they're distinct, 
they still have this gingery dormouse feel about them, don't they? They're leaner to look at, but the most important thing is this tail. And they've got what's called a prehensile tail, and they'll use that to hold on to the stalks of, um, of grasses and things like that. And these are tiny little mites. They're about this size. You know, the, the dormouse is about that size. So this is one of our smaller mammals. Um, but by no means, you know, any less cute and adorable. So always on that lookout for more harvest moss records. And the places that we have them are more where there's margins of fields that still continue with oats and different sorts of wheats and things like that because they prefer those obviously seed bases and hedgerows and margins. And there are a few records along canals. And then quickly on to the roles. So we have three types of voles in the county. This is two of them. We have the field vole and we have the bank vole. So the field vole is a grayer animal, a bigger animal, um, whereas the bank vole has this ready color to it. The field vole is almost particularly hidden, whereas the bank vole you can just about make out in here. Um, I remember these two by saying short-tailed field vole, because that has a short tail whereas the bank bow has a mostly more long tail. In the Yellow Valley, you will find the field bow in some of those wet field edges, um, as you would imagine. The bank bow tends to be in bank, bank and walls and sort of on woodland edges. You would get crossover, but that's generally their habits. So that's just a few shots from our survey of uh, mostly voles, the mouse there, and the shrew in the Yellow Valley that's up by Craig Gore a few years ago now. That's one of the ways we get to sort of look at them closely. And in our sort of river system and on our rossy areas, those wet areas with little um, streams and things, the other thing we have in Rancher is the water bowl. And uh, like I said to you before, water bowls are in, were in a lot of trouble. They declined by 97%. Much of that is to do with the introduction of the mink, which can seek out, fit into the burrows, and take out the young. Uh, of course, it's straightening some of the water systems, not making them so favourable. They quite like slow moving water, so they sort of like canals and uh, pools and things like that. And the Ellen Valley, about 10 years ago, maybe a bit more, was made the first upland key area for water bowls in the UK. Having considered water bowls always being the ratty that you would find wind, wind in the willows by the uh, canal banks and things like that. They were found the water rolls above 400 metres in Scotland and it's brought about that oh, we should be looking for water rolls higher up. So there are actually water rolls in most of the uplands of the Ellen Valley in the different little streams in the peatlands. And the reason it was made a key area was because it was hoped that maybe some of those water rolls might be used to sort of um, bring them back down to the lowland areas where they've been lost. But uh, that, that's not really needed to be happening because there are breeding programs now to breed uh, bulls and then they're released to places like, you know, Slimbridge down there and uh, towards Cardiff, Newport Way, they've had them there and stuff. So, so um, that has to be done with mink control um, because they will, they will eradicate everything um, within no time and generally mink are found, we've found one mink in the Yellow Valley in about 40 years, and he's over there. <laughs> and, um, you know, they just don't like that upland scenario. They'll go a long way to get their quarry, whereas they can stay by rivers and stuff, and they can do a lot a lot more feed from a mink point of view. So the difference between a water bowl is they're quite big. I mean, when a water bowl is by the waterway, you'll know he's there, because they do start, and once they've been there for a while, you get obvious runs that are about maybe that wide, compared to that of normal bowls. And um, poop, everything comes down to poop when you've got mammals. <laughs> they've got usually all they do leave you. And uh, water bowls poo like tic tacs. So they've got tic tac to look at. They're blunt either end. They're greeny color because all they eat is rushes and vegetation. And they will do these little poos in piles, which are called latrines. So when you come across a latrine like that, which is once you've seen a few that are really obvious, and all bowls will have latrines, but these are like tic tacs. Um, you could tell that at least a female has been there because she's leaving her calling card for males that are moving in and out. 
Um, so that's one of the things we look for when we're looking for them. And then they also, they chew the remains of the vegetation at sort of angles. So you will have little strips of vegetation um, that's obviously water bone. They have a shorter tail than the rat. So that's what you would might get mixed up when you see something going across the water. Water bowls tend to make a plop when they first go in. That's usually the first thing you notice is what was that plop. That's a water bowl rolling down. Whereas a rat tends to be quite buoyant and it'll go across the water and its tail will be with it. Um, and it's a greyer blunter. There's a blunter muzzle on the water bowl, whereas the rat has got a pointier tail. Uh, he's got ears. Mickey Mouse ears, uh, whereas the water bowls are just about safe. And there he is, and there he's quite deep the water bowl. And there's just a, a coloured picture for you to see the differences. And then these are some of the signs I was telling you about. These are the sort of places you'll find water bowls. There's a tic tac poo. These are the runs, they are tunnels, and they're like that slow moving upland uh, water courses. Poo. <laughs> and then we've just got to put in, we're getting to the end now, we'll be glad to get the pencils out. But we've got um, a grey squirrel, so of course they, they kind of, that is pretty cute, like, you know, mm. but they, you know, obviously they have had an impact in the UK, and, and like that's on things like our dawn lights and our red squirrels, because they do carry squirrel pox, and it doesn't tend to bother them too much, but it is wiped out our red squirrel populations. Uh, um, which are more susceptible, they're able to get the food earlier than our more native species. But when we come back to the pine martin again, pine martin are thought to have quite a, because of pine martin and the red squirrel, so you just think it's kangorns in a forest somewhere, they have cohabited together for, for generations and generations. The red squirrel is lighter and he's quicker in the trees, whereas the grey squirrel is fatter and he's not used to predators. And the gray, the red squirrel is, and they can sort of fit into the same ecosystem, the pine martin and the red squirrel. But when a pine martin and a gray squirrel mix, there's this impact, and they have, they've done research now in Ireland. They thought it was, and it has been proven that um, firstly, the gray squirrels know, get the feeling that there's a predator out there, and they they clear off. And the other thing is, they're slower and they're fatter and they're quicker on the menu and soon the pine martin. So they think the pine martin could have a um, balance and impact. And where, see, in Ireland, uh, in one place, they had grey squirrels in this forest for years, this forest manager had noticed. And then he went back and there were red squirrels. And he says, there's red squirrel here. What's been happening? Oh, I haven't had a grey one in the law for ages. He said, but there's something in the law. And when they looked, it was pine martin. And the only difference had been was the pine martin had come back and the grey squirrels had gone. So it's maybe addressing the balance within nature, I suppose. And then we go to the red squirrel. So a few years ago, went to, um, back to the Cairngorms where I saw the pine martin and saw the red squirrel. So you've got this lovely tufty, tufty ears. Uh, not always on him all year round. Um, mostly on the winter coat. Uh, it can be a little bit greyer and really, really red. So uh, uh, really lovely native squirrel that we have records for this area going back to the 1960s. And then they started to go and it was more grey records. And uh, I know people saying that you know when they were children, they used to go to their farm in the Ella Valley through the wood and they would see red squirrels running everywhere. So it sort of is, uh, I don't know, it's sort of sad and yet it's sort of exciting to think that those people have seen that. And hopefully with the pine martin in the area, you can always hope that one day we'll have red squirrels running around the game. And I do have a box of bats for you, uh, just to have a feel about the size of bats. And, and these are fascinating. I won't talk too long because I do a whole section on, on bats alone. But this is one of my favourite bats. This is Brown Romeo's bat. He's got these big, obvious ears. And this is called the tragus. Those are features we need to identify different bat species. This is a little pipistrelle here, much to my husband's distress. I was uh, giving it mealworm on the kitchen table in the morning <laughs> before school and the kids were having their cornflakes and he's like, do you have to do that here? <laughs> anyway, the little pepper straw made it all right and uh, uh, not very often do I take things in because they are pretty time consuming. So there are definite fat carrots now that do it. Um, so bats are beautiful and bats are important because bats tell us 
how the rest of our natural world is. They depend on insects, and insects are the base. Soil and insects are the base of everything, and um, for all animals. Um, bats, again, other species, they're generally doing all right. They move into our homes and they've adapted with that. But of course, those, those winters are probably the biggest thing that they suffer because they are true hibernators. So if they can't put on their body fat as well in the autumn, they find themselves struggling to make it through, through the winter to the next year. But they are amazing animals, trust me. Because when I first came around, I showed there was such a negative attitude towards bats. They were mice on rings, and we had a bat in the house last night, and I was sleeping in the bat. And then I remember going to a long house, but they had some visitors staying, and they had bats flying around, because there is a roost there in the Claremont Valley. And I went in, I have to admit, this thing was flying around. And it was, it was disturbing, like, it's going to go over your head, or whatever. So, but okay, I can get with that. Um, and then I had to sort of try and get the bat out, and explain about bats. And then when I looked at the kitchen, they're from London, and I looked at the kitchen on the table, the coffee table, there was a book called Dracula. And I thought, I don't think this book was very well. <laughs> and I think they were moved into the next house. But there were people that would go there to stay just to see the bats. So uh, and it is a great roost if you ever get a chance to go and see the bats emerging. And this is in the Cumella Mines. So I've known this for a number of years, but used to go in there just to see what bats were hibernating. We were particularly interested in trying to whether any left the horseshoe bats in the mines. And there isn't anything more beautiful than being in a cold, dark, dark mine with a bat hanging up next to it, but they sort of have this condensation around them because they're in the winter and they're covered with little blobs of like, um, little blobs of uh, water. And they look like little baubles of a Christmas tree. And they'll spend most of their like, winter and they'll use a cave or, or a tunnel like that. And as the weather changes, they will move in and out, you know, to keep an optimum temperature um, for their hibernation. They don't want to be freezing, but they don't want to be warm and warmed up. So if you go into a cave to survey for bats, you have to make sure that you spend as least time as you can in there to get the information. Because as you're in there, you're generating heat. And that heat is enough to wake bats up. So it's a... Uh, it's a very care, so you have to choose the right day. A couple of uh, trail cameras for roe deer. We get increasingly more roe deer mm -hmm. sightings from the other valley, and again talking to the farmer the other day, one of the other species they noticed an increase, other than the hare, was the roe deer. And already we've had three records in the valley. We get a few records on Nantmel, uh, we had a dead one uh, just outside Raider um, a couple of years back. Uh, but they're lovely. They're the ones with the really big ears. They've got like a real white rump on them. And these little black noses and the bucks have uh, uh, obviously little antlers as well. But they're only about this size. Uh, I think somebody hit one the other day, one of the men was sitting in the car. So you wouldn't want to do that. They're big enough to be. And we have very few, they're not really a common sight in uh, Radnorshire, but we do have a few um, red deer records as well. Any and again, we don't have these in Ranch, but it's a sneaky name. <laughs> this is a seal um, you know, taken down in Norfolk, and again, great experience because I live landlocked in Radnorshire. Never really had a chance to enjoy seals, so having four days just to sort of enjoy and watch them with binoculars and, and stuff as well was fantastic because I didn't realize how sociable and social a species they are. Watching the males, they were huge things when they. So they've gone up and they were fighting against each other and there was blood and blubber everywhere and, and they're fascinating and again another species that uh, you know needs man to give it space when it comes to pop and then you know uh, they'll find out lovely exciting things they're their first few twin pups that they've never really seen much of when we were there talking to the to the warden and again very vulnerable so they come they're, they're pupped on the beach and it'll be three weeks, and mum will feed to them, and she'll give them this really rich milk, and they'll just get fat, fat, and fat. But they're covered with this white, beautiful um, coat, but that coat is not at all uh, waterproof. So if it goes to the sea, or if a uh, dog was a big problem down there, dogs were chasing, and if they chased the seal pup into the sea, uh, it, it died. It, it, couldn't, it couldn't keep itself up. Um, and then they had some tags and they were monitoring how they move around the ocean. And of course, seals are a very important food source for other animals in the ocean. But I just wanted to touch on them because they're fascinating uh, animals. 
And it was just important, I thought, we've got more of the feelings I've talked about. We produced a, an atlas, so we had a distribution of where the animals were across the county. We have very few animal records. And we hopefully will produce another one to see how the recording effort has helped and build a better picture of where our mammals are in Radnorshire. So that's why mammal records are important. So that's why it's making a contribution. If you've got a time, just send an email, send it to the Wildlife Trust, send it to me, whatever. And all you need, there's great apps out there as well on your phone to take photographs and upload it. And all you need to know is what you think you see, um, whereabouts, uh, when you saw it, and who you are. And that's all we need for a record. And uh, this is just showing um, the records, uh, the difference in records for um, stoats and weasels. So this is Radnorshire, most of them in the Yellow Valley, but I think that's just because I'm recording a lot there. And a few little, this is very poorly uh, covered in Radnorshire, but of course you will get stoats all over it. It'll be, that's, an older, that's one of the old records. And uh, again, just showing the difference of recording. There's obviously a lot of traffic going along here. I reckon they're probably all RTA road traffic accidents for hedgehogs, but they're very important. Again, they're all in the Yellow Valley, but and Ranger area. So it's just like uh, they're not, they were all over. So the, having the Howie Hedgehog Rescue really did help get us to know where they were in the county. And that's what's a record. So who? What the cat brings in, what we find dead on the road, um, these little mice that ended up dead in, in, a, in a little um, file pack, how they ended up there, I don't know. But anything is a record, really. Um, live sightings, prints, they're hard to ID. There's an old record here at Kilowant of a red deer stag standing in the yard. This is one of our few records. I'm going to have that at Colin that sent us the photo. That's the little bit of my seed in the, in the food delivery and temperature control sheet. <laughs> 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 they weren't supposed to be in there. I don't know that. But, uh, and then again, having events like this, I think hopefully just getting people interested in, in looking and concentrating and learning a bit more about their animals. Um, there this before our pellets and sightings, old bottles. And then that's just a little guide of the different. Um, and then that's it. I end my speech here. Someone's girl says. <laughs>